Ryan Thomas. And how long have you been riding for? Uh, competing, cycling, pure cycling for like 12 years now. Uh, national, international, nas junior national level, and then international for like seven or eight years now. Okay, how many bike fits have you had? I've actually only ever had one proper bike fit. Oh, okay. Pretty much, yeah, a lot of a lot of feel, a lot of just seeing on the road, changing things as you go. Yeah, I've had like a bit of an ongoing, uh, it's been about 10 years on and off, uh, numb feet. Okay. So it's varied between the shoes and bikes and the temperature changes it as well. So be interesting to see what Neil says. There's two main sources of foot numbness. One of them is, is blood flow restriction and the other one is nerve compression, right? Either way, yours sounds like a circulatory block just from the way that it spreads in from the lateral part of the foot. So the, either way, because when you get off the bike, it comes good within a few minutes. It means that we've got a really good chance of fixing it because it is purely positional. So hopefully what we see when we stick you on the bike is some sort of causality. Lower back pain, calf cramping occasionally, sorry, hamstring cramping occasionally, and numb feet all make me think that it's either a seat height or a cleat position issue and the third possibility is going to be arch support so the first thing i can see is your left calf is a little bit smaller than your right calf he's a little bit lower on the right you know we're talking four or five millimeters so the left arch is higher than the right one which explains why your right foot is longer as the arch gets flatter right. so see this catwalk here going up to the glass mm -hmm. just go for a walk Everyone always right foot when it hits the ground it pronates over and rolls over through the midfoot more than the left one um, he also lifts his left heel off the ground a little bit earlier than his right heel which would account for why his left calf is a little bit bulkier than his right calf or was it the other way around lots of theories let's have a look at you lying down on your back the amount of lateral movement available in your heel yeah, wow. the ankle's like an upside down u-shaped joint like this and your, your talus here's bone in your foot sits inside this little upside down cup formed by the tibia and the fibula there and basically what, what i'm doing there is moving this laterally yeah, yeah. and yours move a lot <laughs> your right one is is really loose your left one is fairly loose. Prob you may well have broken what we call avulsion fractures. There's actually, I can feel one here. <laughs> a lot of elite cyclists are like this. It's hugely beneficial on a bike because you can rotate your pelvis forward and as your knee comes up, it doesn't strike the edge of the socket. So you don't get hip impingement. So You don't get the, uh, the old mammal. <laughs> you don't get that. <laughs> not that. Not that anyone in this room would ride like that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, mate. What did you find? All right, we basically did absolutely nothing. <laughs> You know, a lot of these high-level guys who are racing, riding 20 hours a week or, th or more, they've often nutted out or nailed down a lot of their finer points of their position by the time they get to me. And Brian was a classic example. His cleat position was pretty good. His seat height, his seat setback, his reach, his drop, all the large things in terms of the bike position were almost perfect. His two main problems were that he would occasionally get right-sided knee pain if he did a lot of like high-intensity, low-cadence hill climbing, and his foot numbness, which was the big gripe. He'd, he tried a lot of things over the years to get rid of it. Um, and so talking about the knee pain first, the solution to his knee pain, he was overextending his right leg a little bit and dropping his right heel. The solution to that was there were three small parts to it. One of them was to stagger his cleat position. So looking at the bottom of his shoes, you can see that this cleat is further forward on the shoe now relative to the other one. Just look at the back edges of them there. You can see that they're staggered relative to each other. So Ryan's right foot is about five millimeters longer than his left. When we staggered the cleat position, he started looking better. In addition, he's got two two millimeter shims underneath that right foot now. So we flagged this when we looked at him in great detail off the bike before we had him on. We thought his right leg might be ever so slightly shorter than his left. We trialed the shim at three millimeter, three millimeters and he looked pretty good. 
and then we tried it at four and he looked really, really good. So this, that was the main sort of components of his symmetry issue. That stopped his right knee diving in across towards the center line of the bike and he looked much, much, much more symmetrical when all that was in place. That's right, yeah, I get people all the time saying, you know, you, surely you can't tell the difference between a four and a five millimeter shim. Can you tell the difference? You can, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Ryan was, he was very cognizant of it because he's quite in tune with his symmetry. Other people aren't, but when I can see it and he can feel it, it's usually a good indication that you're on the right track. And this was the, the weird and wonderful stuff yes. that we did with the bottom of his shoe, with it, sorry, the bottom of his insole. So he already had a nice set of custom made orthotics. We just had a really close look at the shape of his foot and we altered them. We've done a bunch of things here. We've basically allowed his first metatarsal pad to drop down a little bit. And critically, we've taken away a lot of material by, by adding some on elsewhere. We've effectively removed some from the lateral edge. And this is to allow the lateral part of his foot to drop down. And I think that's what was causing most of his numbness. His foot is a little bit plantar flexed across the right hand, across the outer edge basically. And I think that was creating a little bit too much upward pressure underneath the outside edge of his foot. The last little piece of the puzzle is inside there underneath the heel, he's got two little one degree heel wedges. And this is a really fine point. Um, Ryan's heels are really unstable, the rear part of his foot, both sides, but much worse on the right. And this is from old ankle sprains, which we identified off the bike when we were watching him walk, it was obvious. And this is the importance of, you know, assessing a person in great detail off the bike is his rear foot laxity is really, really severe. And so the, one of the first things that I had in the front of my mind when we started fitting him was what happens when we wedge his heels to stabilize his heels from dynamically pronating inside the shoe. That made a large difference to the whip of that right knee across the line of the pedal as well. We did it on both feet because they're both pretty unstable from those old sprains. Um, but I think most of that is, most of the improvement is coming from wedging his dominant right foot. So there's a fair bit going on there. The cleats are staggered, there's a four millimeter shim, there's some, a bit of an odd insole going on and hopefully we've solved his foot numbness. Ryan's got to basically go away and test this now, see what happens. Um, he, he needs to ride for at least an hour, you know, on the road preferably to try and mimic his real world conditions to see if the numbness is gone. And I've given him some instructions, basically a few other things that we might want to test if the foot numbness isn't gone, um, but we'll, we'll play it by ear and Ryan will be in touch over the next couple of weeks. Uh, foot numbness is one of those things when it doesn't present on the bike when you're here, because you're not here for long enough, we often don't know if we've fixed it until we send you away to test. Yeah, so we'll see how it pans out. And the only other change, the only change I made to his bike is I raised his seat three millimeters. That was it. And that is purely because of the extra three millimeters that we had to add to the bottom of the orthotic. And um, so, you know, his general position was pretty much bang on to start with. Didn't have any gripes with it at all. So well done, mate. So immediately after I got the fit on Friday, went to a club race, local club race on Saturday, and I think I was on the podium second or third, uh, and then did one of the local Queensland state races up here, and I uh, got the win. So yes. well, obviously something something worked. Yeah, holding the biggest trophy I've ever seen in my life. It was massive. So. <laughs> I still have a little bit of numbness, but it's just focused on the outside of my foot so before I was getting numbness from the outside and it was translating all over my foot and it was quite painful um, I'm only getting a little bit on the outside now um, and I think it's because of my shoes it's not necessarily because of the orthotics or what we did in the fit um, but it's definitely improved that's for sure it feels really good uh, I obviously didn't know that I had a leg discrepancy so my right leg's quite a bit shorter um, the shim immediately didn't feel awkward at all um, I thought it would take me a little bit to get used to, but did not feel awkward, didn't get many muscle soreness or anything like that. Um, if anything, I kind of noticed that I'm engaging my right leg a bit more. So when I had a fit with Neil, he noticed that my right um, quad and my right calf muscle is a, quite a bit smaller than my left one, um, which is my shorter leg, which is my dominant, but I tend to put a lot less pressure on it. So it was quite interesting when I started riding with that shim in there that I could feel that engagement in that leg. Um, so hopefully the muscles start to grow a bit more and there's a bit more muscle activation in there.